Welcome back to the Ross Bolin Podcast. I am that person here today with producer Cade Oris. Cade, let the people hear your voice. Here is my voice. This is what I sound like on the mic. Fantastic. Fantastic. That way everyone can make the distinction, you know? Right. Yeah. We have a lot to cover today. But first, I had a really weird dream Last night. You know how at the beginning of the movie Dune, you've seen Dune, right? I've seen it, but you've seen it a lot more times than me. Yeah. So I, I don't really remember. It became one of my like go-to wind-down-at-night movies, and I've probably watched it like 20 times now. I'm weird like that, but uh, actually, just to as a small aside, I, I learned within the last couple years at some point, I can't remember when, um, why I do that, why I watch things over and over and over. And it's an anxiety thing. People with anxiety tend to do this because if you watch something where you know it, what's going to happen, you don't have to be anxious, right? Right. Yeah. No, I do this too with yeah. like a lot of TV shows that like I've seen hundreds of times, but I always throw them on at night just to help me fall asleep. Yep. That's the ticket. Uh, well, anyway, at the beginning of the movie Dune, it says, dreams are messages from the deep. Except it's like an alien talking, so it's like, gong, gong, ding, dong, gong, dong, and it just says it in subtitles below. Uh, frankly, that was the first time I've ever tried doing that noise, and it went shockingly well. Sounds pretty spot That was on, almost yeah. exactly what it sounds like, so oh. props to me. Shit. Why'd you, why, what, what did die? Camera, camera just went out on us. Sons of bitches. I'll never crush that impression ever again. Maybe he can get, Cade's up. Cade's up out of his seat trying to fix it as we speak. Maybe we'll just make this part of the show. Why would the battery not be able to be used? Well, fuck it. I'll just talk to the people while you get another battery. Cade's going to get another battery. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see all of this unfolding. It's really exciting stuff. But uh, one of the batteries in our camera just died. Um, let's see. Well, Dune 2 is coming out. I'm trying to delay. <laughs> What I was actually going to talk about, but Dune 2 is coming out later this year, which is probably the single film I am most excited to see in 2023. So we've got that going for us. I think the director's name is Denis Villanueva, if I, if I recall correctly. It stars Timothée Chalamet and Zendaya. Zendaya? Zendaya? There's no one on the other microphone to correct me if I'm wrong, so we'll just have to assume that I'm right. And uh, let's see who else is in it. Um, that uh, the guy from No Country for Old Men, he's awesome. He's in it as well. He got the other camera working, so I think we're just gonna keep. We're All just right. gonna keep going. He's back. He All right, I think it. we're good now. That was so weird. Hopefully, I, literally, it's never happened before. I mean, luckily, it's just my camera, and that's like the least important one. Well, uh, well, arguably, yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I would say like the wide shot. That's probably the least one. important one. The wide shot. Yeah. Anyway, back to my point. So at the beginning of the movie Dune, it says dreams are messages from the deep. Last night, I had a dream that Drake, world-renowned hip-hop artist Drake, hired me to babysit his son, which everybody has seen his son at this point, right? Curly hair, uh, real cute kid, uh, hilarious. He hired me to babysit his son while he filmed a music video at his Toronto mansion. And it was super vivid. Like, you know how a lot of the times when you remember these weird dreams, it's like, it seems so real. Like, yeah, like you're actually there. And I woke up, you know, we got the newborn at, at home. So I woke up at probably like 6.30 when the baby woke my wife up. And then I fell back asleep. And that's when this dream kicked in. So then I woke up again at 7.30, and it was, like, so fresh. Like, I had lived it out in that one-hour period between 6.30 and 7.30. Um, so somebody's going to have to whip out the dream explanation book and tell me what this one means. But I remember very, very vividly Drake explaining to me that I was, like, going to be taking care of his son. He introduced me to the kid, and I was going to be taking care of him. He explained to the kid that I was going to be taking care of him while... Daddy shot a music video, and I guess he just needed somebody to like look after the kid because he was going to be so caught up in the music video. And I don't know, like, like they didn't have a nanny around that day or something. I was right, the fucking they just nanny. Called you up? <laughs> yeah, I don't know why he would call me. Uh, we don't know each other. That would be pretty wild. Uh, but then Drake like went off and shot the music video, and me and this kid just like 
ransacked the pantry for starters. I'm sure Drake has the best snacks. And I think that came from like when I was a little kid and I went to school uh, with all rich people. Whenever I would go to one of my friends' houses, that was like one of the first things I would check. Like, what is this? What is the pantry situation? Because rich people have crazy. First of all, they're huge. Like, one of my friends had a pantry that was the size of my bedroom. And I remember just, like, going into it. It was, like, multi-fucking late. Like, you, like, turned a corner to, like, get to the rest of it. And, uh, we anyway, we just went ham on Drake's fucking pantry eating snacks. And then at one point, like, I don't remember all of it, you know. But, like, at one point, I remember me and the kid, we walked into a room where they were shooting. Like, Drake was in there. It may have been, like, the master bedroom, but there were a bunch of strippers. So Drake was, like, there the whole time? Yeah. He just He just needed you to, to look, look after Look after the kid. Like, you know what I'm... They're like, going to give, him, like, some intern that job? Like, had to be Ross me. Bolin for this? Had to be me. He was like, I know just the guy for this job. It's got to be Ross Bolin. And he brought me in. You know, I'm a consummate professional. Um, but the kid was, like, totally unfazed by the strippers. Like, he was just like, yep, this is my that's, house. Yeah, that's probably, like, an everyday thing for him at like, this point. Damn, this is wild as hell. But, uh... Well, maybe yeah. Drake actually wants you to uh, come babysit. Sometime. No idea. No idea what that was about. Because usually when I have a really odd dream, I can pull at least some of the psychological meaning behind it. Like, it's, I, I have enough experience trying to, I guess, that I've kind of got it down where I can usually figure out, like, oh, I was anxious and this dream was a result of me being worried about this one thing or whatever. But in this case, I don't have the slightest fucking clue. I haven't even been, like, listening to a bunch of Drake lately, which is normally not the case. Typically, he's in pretty heavy rotation. But, uh, yeah, it was bizarre. And, Cade, ironically, I had this dream last night after yesterday during the day you told me that you've been having really weird dreams lately. So that's the only thing I can tie it to. Is you were like, yeah, I've been having weird dreams, and then my brain was like, time to serve one up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're due for one. Got to get Drake and his fucking kid in there for you to babysit. Just bizarre. But will you share one of the weird dreams you've had as of late? Yeah, I um, so I stopped smoking weed for a little bit, and but the like old I tea need, break. Yeah, but I need help falling asleep still, so I take melatonin, and it doesn't really work. But I feel like it's been giving me some weird dreams. And I had I had a weird one last night, but I don't really remember it. That's the thing about dreams, like, like if you don't like write it down or something, like immediately, I feel like, yeah, I feel like it's it's in and out of your head. Yeah, um, oh yeah, definitely. But there's one like a few days ago, and it was like two separate dreams, uh, and like I don't rem- remember much about the first one, but I remember I was in a plane with like my cousin and a couple other people that like I kind of knew, but not really, and we were like in a forest and we we're like trying to take off. Um, from the ground and like we were just like going past all these trees and stuff and like i felt like i was gonna die there's like fire around me too and then like oh I, god i think we ended up like going back down and like crashing and like i woke up immediately because i think like when you're about to die in a dream that's like when you wake up a lot of the time yeah don't they say if you die in your dreams you die in real life i think that's yeah that's the quote i don't if, know what that's from but if you don't like wake up beforehand yeah um and then like it got into so i went back to sleep and I was like, "How? <laughs> I don't know." Yeah, it, it well, it took me a minute to fall back asleep, and then I ended up uh, doing it. And I had another dream, like immediately after, and I was like playing like Call of Duty Zombies or something, but it was VR. And I remember like putting on the headset, and I was at like Kino de Tur- Toten or whatever, and like it was like pretty intense, like playing. Is that in- the map? Yeah, that's one of the maps. Sick. Yeah, and like it was like super intense. I was like, "Okay, no, I gotta take it off." I take it off. And I'm like in the middle You're of there? like a no, like oh. just like a different zombie apocalypse. Like I see like people running past me and stuff and like oh, shit. zombies are chasing them, like people are shooting guns at them. That's I, deep, dude. Yeah, and then like again, like a zombie was like about to come attack me and I just like woke up again. And then that one took me a, a really long time to to fall back asleep because that was like super in your face. That has to mean something. Well the first one Sounds like it's just like a scene straight out of Narcos, like when they're trying to take off that plane from South America and that like really short landing strip or whatever, and they don't think they're going to be able to pull it off. I'm pretty sure that's Narcos, but it's one of those drug running movies or shows. Um, that one sounds like, and I'm not an expert, but that one sounds like just like a general anxiety dream. The yeah. second one, I have no fucking clue. That sounds multi-layered. It literally was multi-layered, I guess, but yeah. it, it, that's deep shit. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't really know what it all means, but I do have like one reoccurring dream a lot. It has to do with, like with football, and like 
I either like forget like my pads or like some like sort of equipment. Oh yeah. And then like I have to like go out on the field, but like I'm not prepared. <laughs> and then like there'll be times where like I'm like trying to put on my gloves and like it just like takes forever and like I need to be out there right now. I'm just like oh, freaking out. <laughs> That's like so classic anxiety. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's like when how everybody will have the one where it's like a, a common recurring dream where uh, you wake up and you've slept through your alarm and you're going to miss a final in college. Like people have that dream decades after they've exited school. Yeah. You wake up and you've missed a test or uh, one that I think is my mom. In fact, I'm, I'm maybe both my mom and my dad, one of my parents, I can't remember and I don't want to misspeak, but one of the two. Uh, would commonly have the dream that they were n- just stark ass naked in class, just butt assed in the middle of class, like in your classroom, Ooh. but nude and at your desk or whatever, which is another one that a lot of people have. A common recurring dream, anxiety dream that I used to have was uh, that my teeth were falling out. Yeah. No. Just out of my fucking <laughs> head. It was awful. And I had this, it was like, because I had braces for almost four years when I was a kid. So I think I was worried about my teeth a lot. And it ended up like manifesting itself years later, even after I'd gotten the braces off in the form of this dream that I would either have a dream that my braces were coming off, that they had like broken. And it, I had this dream so many times, that one about the braces breaking and like being off and the wires were off in my mouth, that that is like, even as I say it out loud, I'm like, wait a minute, did that really happen at some point? Like, that's how many times I had the dream. And it absolutely yeah. did not happen at any point, but I thought it was real because it happened so many times in my fucking sleep. Um, but the other one is, would just be that, like, my teeth were falling out. Like, I'd, like, suddenly have a tooth fall out. And then... Not fun. No. I would wake up and they'd all be no, there. Not what you want, yeah. Still felt like a real loss, you know? Then, like, another one I think a lot of people have is, like, when you feel like you're just like falling into like nothing. Mm. I feel like I get that a lot when I'm supposed to be sleeping when I'm not like in the like, old falling dream. Like in the classroom at church or something. Yeah. Where you're like trying to dozen off and then you're like, oh shit, I need to be up right now. Yeah. Could yeah. you ever sleep successfully in class or church? Uh, I've, ne- I've never been able to do it. No, no. Like, I, like, I just get too paranoid. I'm like, because I know I shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. I, I always felt super jealous of the people who could just like put their head down on their desk and and catch some Z's, because that was never me. I would, like, nod off and immediately freak the fuck out. Yeah. Um, and then in church, I was just too scared. I always felt like, not even just of, like, my parents or God, <laughs> it was that I was scared the pastor would call me out. That he'd be like, you, well, little shit, sleeping in the needs pew. To, needs to, you know, give a better sermon then. Yeah. Like, that's on him. Make this shit more entertaining, right? dog. Putting us to sleep out here. Damn. With all this homophobia. <laughs> but... Uh, but anyway, dreams are weird. That was the point. And I had one where I babysitted Drake's son last night. Um, in other news, I am extremely tempted to count the exact number of tortillas I eat in a, in a, in a calendar year with four tortilla chips counting as one tortilla. Because like as I've discussed before, you, know, you don't really think about this until you go to one of those Mexican restaurants where they have really big chips and you're like, holy shit, this is a fourth or sometimes a half of a tortilla. And uh, you realize, like, oh, my God, four tortilla chips typically amounts to, like, if you put them together, it's the circle. Yeah, it's a, a little puzzle, yeah. It's a tortilla, yeah. Uh, but between tacos, which I eat a lot, I mean, we have a lot of tacos for lunch at Bowling yeah. Media. Like, pretty often we get taco deli, we get torchies, Um my wife and I have taco night at home at least once or twice a month. I eat a lot of tacos. And uh, between tacos and enchiladas, which I love, noted enchilada connoisseur, and the chips with salsa, chips with queso, it has to be an astounding number of full tortillas that I am consuming in a year. Like, it is Wednesday this week, and between tacos and tortilla chips, I've probably already had the equivalent of r- roughly like 50 tortillas. And that's, you know, high-end estimate, but, like, somewhere between 30 and 50. one week. That's just a few days into a week. Like, because I've had, I think I've had chips every single day. And we had tacos once. And I, th- I had tacos on Sunday as well at home. Like, I just, it's a large part of my diet, tortillas. Like, it's entirely possible that if I cut tacos, enchiladas, and tortilla chips out of my life, that I would be absolutely shredded. Like I said recently on the show, I've never had abs before. And I think tortillas might be single-handedly responsible for that fact. Like, I might be an incredibly in-shape man, 
if not for tacos, enchiladas, and tortilla chips, which are a, I don't know, a good 30% of my diet. But you know, you're looking you're looking sharp right now. I'm not huh? saying I don't look good. I, I feel good. I feel like I look okay, but I'm just saying I think I would be like the Terminator, if not for tortilla. I don't want to cut tortillas out of my life, though, because they're delicious and they spark joy. So instead, I'm going to attempt to count and document the number of tortillas I consume in a single calendar year, starting today. That is my goal. And my whole goal. If you're trying to get in good shape and show off that hot bod this summer, our next sponsor is for you. It's FitBod. Personally, with the new baby at home, I've got very little time to focus on my workout routine. I need something to help me out and plan workouts for me. That's where FitBod comes in. The FitBod app creates a workout program that's personalized to your goals, fitness level, and most importantly, if you're me and you work out at home, your available equipment. It learns from your previous workouts and adapts as you improve. Start making progress towards your fitness goals today with 25% off a FitBod subscription using our special URL. You just pick a fitness goal like building muscle or trimming fat or general, you know, physical wellness. And FitBod will create a custom workout program for you. Whether you've been missing time at the gym or you hit a plateau, which was largely where I was at, FitBod will build a workout plan individualized to you. The app switches up your exercises so you avoid overtraining or burnout while keeping your workouts fun and fresh. Your program also changes based on your personal progress for maximized results because you log Each set that you do with the amount of weight that you do, it's super easy. Whether you work out in the weight room or your living room or in your garage like I do, FitBot has you covered. Learn new movements the right way with over 1,400 HD demonstration videos. So like when you're you're given your workout for the day, each workout has a video with it. So if you're like, oh, damn, I don't remember how to do dumbbell flies. You just click the video and it shows you a person doing it so you don't have to figure it out for yourself and don't end up hurting yourself like doing it incorrectly or whatever. It's fucking awesome. A full year of FitBot is less than the cost of a single session with a personal trainer. I've been using the FitBot app for at least a couple weeks now to dictate my workouts, and it's legitimately fucking awesome. I do it a couple times a week. Before I started using FitBot, like I said, I did the exact same workouts every time I worked out for like over two full years and I hit a major plateau that shit was not doing anything for my body I was just like maintaining I wasn't like getting more in shape or stronger FitBot has changed that FitBot is the future it has everything you wish those other apps had keep up your fitness habit with a personalized workout program from FitBot get 25% off your subscription or try the app free at fitbod.me slash ross that's f-i-t-b-o-d dot me m-e slash ross for 25 percent off your subscription or just try the app for free at fitbod dot me slash ross genuinely awesome app um holler at me if you try it on social media i'd love to talk about the results and what you like about it and what i like about it and all that on uh twitter or instagram or whatever it's awesome fitbod thanks for sponsoring us really love the product um now it's time for some insane headlines of the day because just like tortillas or tortillas as some people call them Insane headlines also spark joy for me. Here's your first one. And this is a this is a wild one. Buckle up. A Utah mom wrote a kid's book about grief after her husband's death. Now she's been charged with his murder. From CNN, Corey Richens' husband, her name is Corey, but spelled K-O-U-R-I, which just might be the whole explanation for the story. Corey Richens' husband was found dead at the foot of their bed last March. She'd just closed on a house for her business, she told investigators at the time. Around 9 p.m., she brought her husband, Eric, a celebratory Moscow Mule cocktail in the bedroom of their home in Utah. She left to sleep with their son in his room and returned around 3 a.m. to find her husband lying on the floor, cold to the touch. Uh, About a year to the day after her husband died, she published a children's book called Are You With Me? About navigating grief after the loss of a loved one. But investigators now allege she killed her husband of nine years with a lethal lethal dose of, you guessed it, illicit fentanyl. She really went for it. This month, they charged her with aggravated murder and three counts of possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute. Newly released court documents detailed a series of illicit fentanyl purchases in the months leading up to his death. So it sounds like she, like, slowly poisoned him, basically. Yeah, she's been playing this for a while. Yeah, 
Corey Richens, 33 years old. So this is two years younger than me. It's always crazy when you hear, it's like almost like when you get older and uh, professional athletes start being your age, like which is where you're at, around right, like yeah. 25, when you're like, holy shit, most, this is like, look at, the, look at what these guys are doing every day, and then look at me, is how I felt anyway. Um, whenever I read about something like horrific happening in the news with like a family, and I'm like, damn, these people are my age or younger, like what, it just makes it even crazier. Uh, but Corey allegedly bought the drugs from an acquaintance identified as CL in court documents. Weeks before her husband's death, the Richens had marked Valentine's Day with a dinner at home. Shortly after the dinner, Eric became very ill, Eric told a friend, that he thought his wife was trying to poison him as a result, court documents say. So, some cold shit. It Where's sounds like she... she- she like went for it on Valentine's Day. That was her initial. But it didn't yeah. like she didn't get him all the way dead. He just like got really really sick. It's, but it it doesn't take much fentanyl to like. No, that's the thing though. As I think she was trying to be like, she was trying to be you know careful enough with it that when they did the autopsy and like the toxicology, oh, it, it, would, it wouldn't up. like necessarily flag. I don't really know what her her her, her train of thought here was. Probably not entirely sane. But she was arrested this Monday and remains in custody. An autopsy and toxicology report revealed that Eric, uh, her 39-year-old husband, died of a fentanyl overdose. He had about five times the lethal dosage in his system, according to the medical examiner. So just going off of pure speculation here, it sounds like on Valentine's Day she tried to get him, and it wasn't quite enough, and he got suspicious. So the next time she just went ham with it, and it was five times the lethal dose, like way more than even was necessary to kill him. Uh, investigators then obtained a search warrant and seized his wife's phone and several computers in their home where they discovered communications between Corey and CL, who had an extensive police record, CL did, that included drug-related offenses, court documents say. So she, like, had some some friend or acquaintance who was, like, known drug person that she was like, they'll hook me up with the fentanyl, and she was right. CL then told detectives that at some point between December 2021 and February 2022, Corey contacted CL and asked for prescription pain pills for an investor. CL said they obtained hydrocodone and left the pills at, the pro- at a property Corey was flipping, picking up cash left for them, court documents say. Then a couple weeks later, Corey reached out and asked for, quote, some of the Michael Jackson <laughs> stuff. Some of the Michael Jackson stuff, which famously Michael Jackson was being uh, given fentanyl uh, or propofol, I think is what what he was getting, one of the two. But um, apparently Corey allegedly went to CL's house around February 11th and paid uh, $900 for 15 to 30 fentanyl pills that CL had obtained from a dealer. And about two weeks later on February 26th, she allegedly allegedly reached out to CL for even more fentanyl pills. And CL left them at an outdoor fire pit at the same property where the hydrocodone had been delivered. And again, money was left there for pickup. But hilariously, by this time, according to court documents, Corey no longer even owned that property. So she pulled off an illegal drug deal for fentanyl at a house that she had sold, is what it sounds like. Why did why does she need so much? I have no idea if she was like poisoning him little by little over a long period of time. But then or she just said, she, fuck it, and like, I'm just going to. Or if she was like using it herself potentially to some degree or something. Like, I don't know. Who knows if the if the full extent of the details of what happened here will, will ever like come out. But um, just wild, especially because you hear about fentanyl so much in the news, right? Like, it's just, uh, it's an insane fucking story. But it's one that got shared with me in the form of an Instagram clip. And I'm trying to get the date on this actual clip right now because it sounds like some of this shit was happening in like 2021. So I don't, I have no idea, but maybe this is a little bit older story than I thought it was. Um, but uh, so she no longer owned that property. And then for months after her husband's death, Corey worked on her book. And it says, last month, she appeared on Good Things Utah, a show on local television station ABC4, to talk about the importance of her children's book on mourning. She said it's based on three concepts, connection, continuity, and care, and that her three sons helped her write the book to help them articulate their feelings. And then weeks later, she was arrested in her husband's death, and her detention hearing is set for May 19th. So, just a fucking... Crazy story from the fact that she sounds like repeatedly tried to kill her husband with poison, essentially, did pull it off, and then 
her three sons who probably struggled with the grieving process, she was like, well, I'll write a book to help them. The major red flag being, of course, that she was responsible for the grief in the first place because she fucking killed the guy, allegedly. Allegedly. Jeez, wild stuff. All for a, a New York Times bestseller. I know, and for a <laughs> Moscow mule. Yeah, this, no, this story is definitely recent. Okay, it's, I'm, I was just double-checking on Google to make sure. And uh, it says she also tried changing life insurance policies for him beforehand. So she did a lot of things that were like going to be Red easily flags. traceable. Yeah. Dude, one of the wildest things to me when you hear about stories like this is that if you get, essentially, if you are charged with a crime, like all of the stuff in your life that you deemed private, your text messages, your emails, your social media activity... They dig through all of that shit. Like, there is no keeping secrets from the police when push comes to shove. And, uh, yeah, that's just, it's why, because I feel like everybody automatically assumes, like, whatever I text, you know, nobody's ever going to see that as long as I just delete the message. But that shit is not no. the case. I tried to see if you could buy the book, so, uh, and if you go on Amazon, it says, sorry, we couldn't find that page. Damn. So they'll move Kyrie's uh, anti-Semitic documentary, but not this woman's mourning book. Yeah. Sad. I'm sure the publishing company probably pulled it, yeah. frankly. But uh, oh my god, <laughs> what <laughs> the 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 cover of it? Like it's the the dad in heaven. No. Yeah. No. And then like it's a kid playing soccer. It's <laughs> oh no. Oh, it looks just like him too. Oh no. <laughs> oh, I'm looking at the cover. Yeah, okay, okay, it's a kid on a soccer field kicking a soccer ball, and then there's clouds above him with, like, birds flying out of the clouds, and then his dad is popping out of the cloud with angel wings and a halo above his head with his fist raised in the air in triumph like he's rooting like, for his son from they heaven. They literally have, like, uh, I'm sure on, like, one of the pictures, you see, like, the husband in yeah. real life, and it's, like, the same outfit. Yep. Oh, wow. <laughs> with the vest on. Oh, dude, that's so <laughs> twisted. That's some sick shit. Yeah. Marriage makes people do crazy things. Crazy things. Next headline. Set your air conditioner to 78 degrees during the day, 82 degrees at night, federal program suggests. It says a federal program is taking some serious heat, that's a pun, for recommending that home air conditioners be kept at no less than 78 degrees during the spring and summer Energy Star, a program of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Department of Energy, said people should set their thermostat to 78 degrees when they are home and, quote, need cooling in an effort to save energy during the hotter months. And when you're sleeping or away, the suggested temperatures go up. When sleeping, it's recommended that the thermostat is kept at 82 degrees. And when away, people should set the thermostat to 85 degrees, Energy Star said. The recommendations were met with a slew of objections online, mainly with people shocked over the implication that 78 degrees should be uh, used for cooling. It says the department, the U.S. Department of Energy also recommended setting the thermostat to 78 degrees when home. Um, okay, look, I used to roll at 74. That was where I was at. In life, 74 degrees on the thermostat. We live in Austin, Texas. It gets really fucking hot here during the summer. And I would roll at 74, and that was just fine for me. That was, that was, I could, I was good at 74 degrees. Uh, but then when I started dating, when I got married, you know, if your significant other has different uh, thermostat habits than you do, eventually, like if you, if you start living with somebody and they, they put it at 68 every day, eventually, after freezing your dick and balls off for a while, that's what you're going to get used to. It's going to spoil you and your, and your body temperature, and it's going to make you crave the colder uh, thermostat setting. Now, I'm, I'm at like 72, because I've, I've, like, I've corrected back some from where I was at, where I got like, I think I was at 70 for like a couple years there, but regardless, the point is, um, 78 is close to uncomfortably warm when you live in a hot area especially like if it gets up to 90 degrees in austin and you put your thermostat at 78 you're gonna be feeling that shit like we have to crank the ac for a few minutes before we come into the studio yeah, we, i and usually I'm still sweating yeah right i usually put it down to about 70 for a little bit um just so the room will get really cool and then we turn it back up so it will turn off because i'm not trying to be like some kind of fucking energy nazi or anything like that but 
it, it's hot in this state, man. It's hot in a lot of states, and that is an insane recommendation. And I, I would get it for like maybe like the winter, or sure. Like, well, yeah, but like this. Well, obviously, yeah. Uh, but like the summer, the summer, though. the summer, like no, that's way too hot. Um, my dad it, is a psycho. My dad though. does the same shit too. Dude. Yeah. He'll You're, send us shots. In the winter, he sends us screenshots of his thermostat. Um, by screenshots, I mean he takes a photo with his cell phone of his thermostat, and then he text messages it to us. He'll send us, like, how low it gets because he won't turn on his heater, and he thinks it's funny, so it'll be, like, 52 degrees in his house, and he's like, ha-ha, look at this. We're like, <laughs> dude, what is it that you're getting out of this? In the summer, it's the opposite, where it'll get up to, like, 85 in his house, and he'll send yeah. us screenshots of that because he doesn't want to turn on the goddamn air conditioner. Yeah, they're just like, turn on a fan or open a window. I was like, that's not going to do the job. That's not it, man. I'm not trying to be uncomfortably sweaty in my home. Like, we get to the point in Texas where you go outside during the day in the summer, you know the pain is coming. You know you're going to sweat. You know it's absurd out there. When you're indoors, you want to feel comfortable. And I, look, I understand that they're trying to figure solutions to like, take some of the pressure off of the energy grid and whatnot, but at least come with, you know, reasonable recommendations. It's 70 fucking eight degrees. 82 is insane. Dude, and the thing is, if you turn it up to 85 when you're gone, when you get back, it's going to have to work twice as hard to get the temperature back down to a reasonable degree. I just don't understand how that's like working. Anyway, people were fucking losing it on Twitter and Instagram. Like, Fuck you. There's no way I'm turning my thermostat up to 85 degrees. No, Suck granted, no dick. one's, like, enforcing that, so, like, you don't have to. No, it's a recommendation. Yeah. But but a ridiculous recommendation yeah. at that. Next headline, speaking of ridiculous. Robert De Niro, 79, welcomes his seventh child. From CNN, Robert De Niro is a dad again. A representative for the actor confirmed to CNN on, on Tuesday. The Oscar winner first shared the news on Monday in an interview with Entertainment Tonight Canada to promote his new film aptly named About My Father. Speaking of fatherhood in the interview, the 79-year-old politely corrected interviewer Brittany Blair when she mentioned De Niro's previously known six children. Seven, actually, De Niro said, adding, I just had a baby. De Niro has six children from previous relationships, but it's unclear who the mother of his seventh child is. Every once in a while you hear a story like this about, like, that's, look, 70, 79 is old. Yeah, I'm that's, surprised it's still firing. That's an elderly man who's somehow not shooting blanks, which is commendable on some level. But then, like, I just don't, I don't, it feels, look, I don't want to, like, dump on anybody because, I don't know, people with their personal beliefs, whatever. But this feels slightly irresponsible to, to child, to father a child at 79 years old is some wild shit. And the fact that nobody knows who the mother is, is weird. It just makes it feel even weirder. It makes it, it honestly, it just seems like it's probably a 35 year old chick and he doesn't want to get canceled for doing the Leo right. DiCaprio. Does he have like, like a bunch of baby mamas or is it like, or is like the six with one person? It sounds like he's got several. Oh, yeah. so he's on some, like, Nick Cannon type shit. Yeah, but, like, as a grandpa. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like that's going to be Nick Cannon in, I don't know how old it is, but, like, 30 years. Now, look, here's why I say, like, I don't want to dump on anybody. What if it's, like, some 35-year-old chick who's like, Robert, I want to have your baby. I know you're going to be dead in the next 12 years. I'm just guessing conservatively. He's 70 fucking nine. But regardless, I want to have a child with you. Who am I to judge Robert De Niro for granting that woman that wish? You know what I'm saying? It's not like the kid's ever going to want for anything. He's going to be loaded. But then on the flip side, there has to be some negative consequences of being raised by a goddamn grandpa of 79 years old. This man's from a totally different fucking generation. <laughs> that, like, things just went differently back then. It's just, it's just, it's kind of bizarre. It's really funny to me. And, uh... A 79-year-old Robert De Niro has He's just had a baby. He's going to have to roll out the oxygen tank when they play catch. No shit, man. Fucking crazy. Next headline. Speaking of crazy, <laughs> and I use that term uh, with respect, rapper designer charged with indecent exposure on plane days after tweet about mental health. You remember designer? Panda, oh, yeah. Panda, 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 Panda. Yeah. Great song. 
Um, from USA Today, the rapper designer was charged Monday with one federal count of indecent exposure on an aircraft after authorities say he masturbated on a flight from Tokyo to Minneapolis. The misdemeanor filed against the rapper, whose real name is Sidney Royale Selby III, is punishable by no more than 90 days of imprisonment and a $500 fine. Man, that is a cheap fine for cranking on a plane. I thought it would be, like, significantly more. 500 bucks is jack shit. This is one of the funniest things about fines to me. Like, just as a random example, you get a DWI. It's like somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand dollars to pay that shit off all the way, and if you're filthy fucking rich, that's nothing. It doesn't matter to you. If you're in like the lowest tax bracket, that could destroy years of financial stability for you and your family, right? Why is there not a sliding scale for punishment? Like it doesn't really make sense. Like there are people who, if you get pumped or popped for DWI, your fucking life is over. And then there are people who are like, it doesn't matter at all. That's I'll just throw That's this money at change, it. It's yeah. pocket change. It doesn't matter. It's fucking crazy to me. But like, if you jack off on a flight and you're worth millions of dollars, a five hundred dollar fine is not gonna. It's not gonna make. He probably me, has that on him. You probably or, think about doing it again. Yeah. At that point, because it's only. Well, but really, five hundred like that's not. It's not too crazy, you know. It's nothing. Yeah. It's nothing. It's the same thing with speeding, right? Like there are some people you get a speeding ticket like that fucks up your month. You might not even make rent. Some pe- and then others it's like this doesn't even matter. You almost feel encouraged to speed. It's so cheap. Uh, back to the story. The criminal complaint said a flight attendant first spotted Selby. We'll just call him designer. First spotted designer exposing himself about 60 to 90 minutes into the April 17th Delta flight. He covered himself, but five minutes later, two flight attendants spotted designer masturbating. Again, he was told no (laughs) and covered himself, the complaint said. I just, that's like, treat him like a dog. Like, no, no, bad designer. (laughs) 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 And also just, it's like, this is my nightmare, I think, being on a a long flight. And designers masturbating next to you. And designers specifically is cranking next to me in his seat. Was, was the bathroom, like, occupied, occupied or something? Maybe the seatbelt sign was on, yeah. you know? It says the lead, the lead flight attendant then came to, to designer's first-class seat and said that he was going to be arrested. But a short time later, a flight attendant <laughs> spotted designer exposing himself a third time. Designer was then moved to the back of the plane where two travel companions agreed to monitor him. There, he told his security guard that he was, quote, bugging and had, quote, messed up and was, quote, sorry, the complaint said. Designer apologized to the air crew at the end of the flight and then was detained. When questioned by the FBI, designer said he, quote, didn't get much in Japan and found one of the flight attendants attractive, so he exposed himself, which I'm quite certain his lawyer would have advised against admitting. Yeah, probably should have kept that one close to the chest. They were like, what were you doing, dude? And he was like, I'll be honest with you, I didn't get much pussy in Japan. And that that flight attendant, man, she was thick with three Cs. <laughs> and I just had to take it out. Just had to. Uh, the charges came just days after he announced in a tweet Thursday that he was ashamed about what happened on the plane, that he was admitting himself to a facility to get help and was canceling all his shows. He tweeted, quote, mental health is real, guys. Says no attorney is listed for him in the online court records. Look, hilarious story aside, this is May. It is Mental Health Awareness Month, as we discussed on the last episode. So I figured working in a mental health-related story about masturbating on a commercial flight, it made sense, right? And in all seriousness, letting your mental health deteriorate can lead to some seriously questionable and in some cases highly illegal decision-making. So take care of yourselves, uh, part of this story is that also apparently he like he dealt with something overseas and they gave him like some medication that he may or may not have been on on this plane that made him a little loopy or whatever. I will never f- understand, I hope, knock on wood, trying to masturbate on a public flight. I mean, it's one thing if you're on a private plane and there's no air, there's no flight attendants and nobody's yeah. coming back there. I mean, I could see how that would be tempting. Like, you're 30,000 feet in the air on a, on a fucking... Yeah, just drop loads all over. You're just like, oh, you know what? I could crank in the sky right yeah. now. I see how that's tempting. I don't understand 
being like, that flight attendant is one hot piece of ace and then pulling your meat out when people can see you. And then being told, no, no. Not, not once, and not then, twice. And then doing it thrice. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a bold move, Cotton. We'll see how it pans out for him. But, uh, yeah, he'll be in court. I'm glad he canceled all of his shows. I'm glad he's getting help. That sounds like uh, a not good situation for the man. So positive thoughts and vibes out for designer, a.k.a. Selby. Who uh, hopefully hopefully gets it together? Because you can't be you can't if you didn't know this. If you're listening and you're like, oh shit, I was just about to take a flight and I was planning on you can't you can't do this on a on a on a commercial flight. Sorry to tell you. Today's episode is also brought to you by Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs makes the most comfortable and versatile shorts, pants, and bathing suits in the entire world. I've been wearing Bird Dogs for several years now. They cannot be beaten. I wear them to sleep. I wear them to do yard work. I wear them to work out every time I work out. I'm in bird dogs. I wear them to go swimming. I wear them to do everything. They fit great. They feel great. They look great. I went to the pool for the first time this summer, uh, day before yesterday, jumped in. Water was great. Was wearing my bird dog swim trunks. Felt phenomenal. They're just great shorts. I would argue they're the greatest. They even look great on my chicken leg having ass. Phenomenal shape. Phenomenal fit. They're awesome. I have several pairs. Probably, realistically, I probably have like 25 pairs of these things at this point, but some of them, they all have funny names. I've got the Art Fart Knockers, Duffy the Vampire Slayers, Uncle Bucks, Teddy Rubskins. Uh, recently, I got the Forest Pumps, Marco Pool Boys, Zero Dark Thirties, and the Tight Wads in my latest box from Bird Dogs. If you want to look like money while you're working in the yard or swimming at the pool this summer, Bird Dogs are the move. And their pants are great for the golf course, the office, or going out to dinner and hitting the bars. They are very versatile. Click on the link in the description below to go to birddogs.com. Enter code BOLIN at checkout. New code, BOLIN, B-O-L-E-N. When you enter that code at checkout, they will throw in a free Yeti-style tumbler with every order. This thing is beautiful. Look, I'm holding it in my hand if you're on YouTube right now. Great tumbler. Beautiful tumbler. Branded with the Bird Dogs bird and the uh, logo at the bottom there. Uh, you get that free with every order when you use code BOLIN on birddogs.com. That's birddogs.com, code BOLIN, to make sure you look good all summer long, and you'll get this free Yeti-style tumbler with your order, birddogs.com, code BOLIN, B-O-L-E-N. Speaking of mental health, <laughs> which feels like an insane transition from that designer story, but... It is a mental health story, and it is Mental Health Awareness Month, and sometimes when people's mental health deteriorates, bad shit happens. It's a fact. I'm just spreading awareness here. I'm not shaming, although that was a crime. I'm not shaming. I'm just saying. Uh, but speaking of mental health, one of my favorite follows on Instagram is at the holistic psychologist. It's actually the period, holistic period psychologist, in large part because... She offers up great solutions for treating and understanding mental health without the use of medication, which if you've listened to my show for a long time, you know how I feel about meds on the whole. Um, because so often in our country, it is the case that instead of treating the actual issue, we, we just, that's causing the bigger issue. Like if you have anxiety or depression, there is an underlying reason you have those things. It's not just that like, well, you have them and now you got to take medication to fix it. That doesn't actually treat the root of your issue, at least not in my experience. Um, granted, I am not a doctor, but the holistic psychologist shares solutions for treating and understanding mental health without the use of medication. And back in February, she shared a post about disassociation, which is something I have dealt with quite a bit on and off most of my life. And I didn't even realize it until I learned about dissociation over the last few years. Disassociation or dissociation, excuse me, is defined as disconnection and lack of continuity between thoughts, memories, surroundings, actions, and identity. So if you dissociate, you may feel disconnected from yourself and the world around you. Like if you've ever had a day, maybe you were just really hungover where you feel like you're kind of outside your body, just like not even fully connected to yourself. That is a version of dissociation. Um, now, the longer, more mental health related version of that is when like for days on end, you can kind of feel this, which is what I have dealt with. Uh, for example, you may feel detached from your body or feel as though the world around you is unreal. It can sometimes feel like you're kind of operating within a dream or that like 
I think this is, de- in my opinion, this is one of the places that people saying, like, we live in a simulation. That kind of comes from this. It's like this disconnection from reality where you're sort of just floating through this weird other layer. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not good. I mean, it's not what you want. Um, and I'm going to read you this post from the holistic psychologist at the dot holistic dot psychologist on Instagram to give you some more insight into how and why this phenomenon of dissociation occurs. She says, I spent most of my life dissociated. I had almost no memories. I felt like I was sleepwalking through life, watching myself overhead. Here's why. Dissociation is an adaptive survival response to chronic stress, overwhelm, or trauma. It allows us to keep going and function when the brain enters survival mode. Growing up, my home life was very chaotic. Both of my parents had their own intergenerational trauma that left them with poor coping skills and an inability to self-regulate. Lack of emotional regulation can make mundane situations extremely stressful. For example, leaving the house, forgetting something, a missed appointment, or any natural life experience can become a near-crisis event. Childhood trauma is often misunderstood because we see events from an adult perspective. From my childhood perspective, being around chronically dysregulated adults felt unsafe. Children personalize events. I brought this on myself. I'm not lovable. In order to keep the bond with a parent figure whose survival depends on. At a young age, I started disassociating. I have very few childhood memories. My brain was saying, it's not safe here. There's yelling and chaos and no one to help you make sense of what's happening. In my late 20s, I noticed a pattern of my partners telling me I was, quote, zoned out. Friends would say, remember when we did X? And I couldn't recall the memory, not ecstasy, X being like, remember when we did blank? Just a feeling it might have happened. I spent years studying dissociation through the lens of survival adaptation, through intentional practices like movement, breath work, relationship connection, creating writing, creative writing, and nutrition, I've been able to return to my body. I share this in hopes that some of you feel less alone. And then it says, do you chronically dissociate? Share your experience in the comments. And I figured out at some point in, in 2020, really 2021, when I was coming off of medication and it was causing me to experience dissociation with a great degree of regularity, that's when it clicked for me like, oh my God, I've experienced this before. Now to a much lesser degree, but I had experienced that before, sort of on and off since my childhood. And it's for similar reasons that she outlines here, just like childhood trauma, stuff from my family life at home. And I very much identified with the part where she said she had almost no memories. There was this point in therapy over the last couple of years where I had a couple few breakthroughs and suddenly I was able to remember like substantially more from my childhood. Like I didn't have a whole lot of memories from before 14 years old. Like I could not pull stuff. Like there were flashes or whatever, but I didn't have a lot of specific memories from before 14 years old. And then I didn't have a lot of really clear cut ones from like 14 to 18. And it was always something that I had noticed. Um, I identified with her saying she felt like she was sleepwalking through life, like watching herself from overhead. That's something that happens when you're pretty extremely dissociated. And the truth of the matter is that this as a mental health problem it is a, it's like an, it's a, as she put it, an adaptive survival response. When your brain, the human brain is so amazing, but when it finds itself or you in situations where you cannot cope or you cannot handle it, it will do things to help you through. Now, in the short term, it is actually helpful. If you're in a home as a child where you don't feel safe, disassociation can help you get through those moments because it disconnects you from the trauma of the situation momentarily, right? If you dissociate out of the room or out of your body, then there's less stress in that moment. But longer term, if you don't correct those behaviors and figure out like, okay, I am safe now, I don't need to dissociate, then that's when it becomes a problem. And a lot of adults in their 20s and 30s figure out that this is something that they've been dealing with as a result of chronic stress, being extremely overwhelmed, or having like childhood trauma or adult trauma or whatever. Um, but it allows you, this phenomenon does, to keep going when you enter that survival mode, like she said. So 
Um, a lot of people that experienced abuse as children, this is something that they deal with that they have to face as adults. And it's uh, oftentimes there's stuff like this that is pretty straightforward and simple, but we just don't know about it because we don't learn about this in school. It's not something that I was ever taught about. It's not something I was familiar with until it sort of came up by happenstance when I was getting off this medication and I was telling my therapist what that felt like when I was dissociating. And she was like, here's what that's called. And here's why it happens. And I was like, oh, fuck. And then it started to click and like things started to roll. And that's one of the beautiful things about therapy is you, I used to think like just going to therapy was the only thing I had to do. Just be there and answer the questions that they had when they had questions, talk about how I was feeling. And that was kind of it. And that is therapy on one level. And it's still helpful on that level. But the deeper level is when you're actually actively attempting to understand yourself better, what you're experiencing and what you're going through. And in order to do that, you have to be brutally honest with yourself and then with your therapist as well, which is the whole point of therapy, that you're talking to a third party that's unbiased, that there's no, it's not like if you tell a friend the deepest, darkest secrets, then they're going to judge you for that. Like this person has no fucking connection to you at all, other than the fact that you are doing therapy with them. And then when you go your separate ways, that's it. You have no outside relationship. You don't see them. You don't hear from them. They're your therapist. Um, and that's one of the things I figured out is that like, if you're feeling anxious and you go into therapy with the intent of discovering why it is you're feeling anxious and then why it is that you respond the way you do to anxiety, eventually, if you work at it, you will sort of discover the root of this stuff. Like, where did it come from? For most of us, it's childhood. Something that happened in childhood that put us in a state where we never fully recovered from it. And that is, that is very, very normal. It's not, that's that, the thing about it that can be difficult to accept is that like most of us, I think it's, the stat is insane. It's like one in five Americans suffer from like a diagnosable mental health issue at this point. One in five. And that's a diagnosable one. But I would argue it's a much higher percentage of people who experience some level of, of, of mental health struggle on a regular basis. And dissociation is one of the ones that I think is super common that people don't even realize that they're going through or that they have. And uh, that can, frankly, long term, prevent you from living a full life. Because if you're not connected to yourself and your body, you can't experience things on the same level. You can't remain present, which is always a thing I've struggled with. And it's a thing that I did one of my recent mental health minisodes on Patreon about that being present is one of the keys to experiencing a full life. And if you can't do that, if you're not present, if you're not practicing presence, if you're not fully there in the moment, in these situations with your family, with your friends at work, it becomes extremely difficult to find joy, happiness, and live a fulfilling life. And this is one of the things that in the past has really prevented me from being able to do that in past relationships and friendships and at work. Um, I wasn't as present as I thought I was because I was mostly dissociated because I thought, or my brain thought that it was protecting me from things, but it wasn't anymore. Um, so yeah, this is just an example of one of the posts that she put up that was like, I was like, damn, that's exactly what I experience on some level. Maybe not the exact same, but very similar, very familiar to me and really helped me to kind of further. It's one of the reasons that I do what I do on this show is the same thing she was saying at the end, that she did this, she put this post up so that other people who experienced dissociation wouldn't feel as alone with it, right? And that was just my goal with this segment today. It's like, because I, I definitely felt the part where she said that children personalize events. I brought this on myself. I'm not lovable. And when you establish that type of thought pattern as a child, which is definitely something I did, you carry that into adulthood. And if you don't break that thought pattern at some point, you will pass it on to your kids and it will affect your relationships and your ability to work and it, it bleeds into everything. And that's where mental health gets really, really, really important. And one of the reasons I focus so heavily on it with this podcast and in my life because we all want to be as happy as we can be. We all want to be as fulfilled as we can be. And when there's barricades like this in our way that we may not even see or understand, it makes it really difficult to do so. Um, so yeah, if you want more stuff like that, follow her. She's great at the.holistic.psychologist. And again, we're in Mental Health Awareness Month, so I'm going to be saying this repeatedly. 
I'm going to sound like a broken record. Go to therapy. If you struggle with this stuff, if, if there's something about your life that is really frustrating you or making things challenging or it's a mental health thing, it doesn't just have to be mental health stuff. I genuinely believe all of the humans, all of us, would benefit from having somebody that we can spend our time talking to that is that unbiased third party that's professionally trained to kind of guide you through this. Um, because I think a lot of people think therapy is going to be like them sitting down and being like interviewed, like peppered with questions. And it may be the first session so that your therapist can get to know you or whatever, or the first few sessions even. But after that, like when I go to therapy, I'm talking 99% of the time. Like my therapist says very little, like every once in a while, she'll be like, like spend more time on that. Like I'll hit on something and she'll be like, that's where you need to be. Think about that more. Tell me more about that. Or she'll ask me like one question about how I feel about something to kind of get me to, she direct, she, they're basically guiding you through it. They're not like executing it for you. You have to do that yourself. And once that clicked for me in therapy, like my whole fucking life changed. So I'll leave it at that because it's a heavy thing, but, um, that really helped me to see that post. I thought it would help to share and, uh, we can move on from there. If it's hard for you to keep up with a supplement routine that comes with a bunch of different products like it is for me, or you don't know where to start with supplements or who to trust, today's sponsor, Athletic Greens, makes that so much easier. Why take a bunch of different things when you can mix just one scoop of powder in water once a day? The flagship product of Athletic Greens, AG1, was designed with ease in mind so you can live a healthier and better uh, life without having to do too much. It's the healthiest thing you can do in under a minute for the uh, for everyone. For each and every one of us, it's, it's super easy. And AG1 has been part of a million or millions of mornings since 2010. In my time using it, I have noticed an increase in energy, mood support. But like the biggest thing for me has been overall digestion. The goal of Athletic Greens is to make it easier for you to live your best life. If you want better gut health, immune system support, if you hate taking a bunch of different pills and vitamins every day and you want something that tastes great, AG1 is for you, baby. If you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Just go to athleticgreens.com slash bolin. That's athleticgreens.com slash bolin to support our show and your body at the same time. Go today, athleticgreens.com slash bolin. So over the weekend, uh, amongst many sporting events, been randomly watching like a bunch of Premier League soccer. Yeah, you were watching some on. I think it was fr- no, you weren't here Friday. It I was, wake up super early though. Yeah, and no, that's no, when the no, shit she is watch on. Them sometimes, yeah, yeah, because the kids. It's like I. I always remember having friends in the past who loved the Premier League, and it's particularly on Saturday mornings. It's on real early. I think they've had like their version of the playoffs going or something recently. I don't know shit about soccer. I know I sound ignorant right now, but. I've been watching a lot of that randomly just because it's what's on in the morning. And when you got kids, I can't just like throw on like, you know, I think you should leave because it's not appropriate <laughs> no, not really. for a four-year-old and a baby to take in. So I've been watching a lot of soccer, uh, but I think it was Saturday. I turned on the TV in the morning and the, Saturday was the first day I've ever taken care of RJ, the baby, for like several hours by myself. And it was it was a trip, an exhausting trip, but um, super special day to me now that I've gotten through it. But the morning of which, when he was taking a nap, I watched the coronation of the king of Eng- of England. It, I watched like a half hour of this, and frankly, it was pretty hilarious. It was like no offense meant to all of our English listeners. I know there are some of you. We obviously have a plethora of, of absolutely absurd traditions and ceremonies and spectacles here in the United States. Sports is probably the number one, um, which everybody has, but like we do it on a different level and you know it. But the coronation of a king in 2023 is just like by definition hysterical. And especially because now the, the crown, as it is called, has very limited power in the actual like UK government, right? It's essentially like... In 2023, if we held a ceremony to coronate the new leader of the Kardashian family in the United States, like it's mostly a super overblown historical celebrity because they're not making decisions anymore. They have a a whole other, you know, they're a monarchy or whatever. They've got a fucking 
parliament and people voting on stuff. Like, I think that technically, like the king or before the king, the queen, Elizabeth, like they weigh in, but they're not like, they don't actually wield they don't get like, the, like the final say. No, they don't wield like supreme governmental influence or anything like that. So it's like mostly a figurehead position now, right? And the closest thing we have to that is something like stupid, like the Kardashians in the United States. Um, not that our government isn't absolutely idiotic, because it certainly is. But this, it just like, it's so out of touch. It's so ridiculous watching this like fucking old ass man get sat in this chair like they put like this crazy get up on him a robe he's got two different royal scepters he's holding they stick the fucking giant crown on him and it just the whole ceremony is like the wildest shit you've ever seen except that it wasn't it didn't seem fun at all like even like uh uh one of the CNN guys that was commenting, like doing the commentating, because you know they've got like, they got like a whole bunch of people like, and now John, they're putting the crown on the king or whatever. Um, I forget his name. He's got white hair. Pretty sure he's gay. Uh, Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it was slipping my mind. Anderson Cooper. He was kind of like, uh, dropping backhanded insults and shit. He was like, "Is it just me, Karen, or does everybody look?" a little miserable like <laughs> which was really fair because i was paying close attention like the king is kind of incapable of looking joyous or happy because he's fucking robert de niro's age and then everyone around them is just like oh this fucking guy you know what i mean it's not like it's some youthful young woman like when elizabeth was coronated back in whatever year fucking 95 years ago <laughs> or whatever that was um it's not some like big exciting change it's this old fucking man and uh, it was just weird. Was a, was a Prince Harry and Meghan Markle there? Uh, the, I don't. The I don't think Meghan went. I don't think she attended. But this is Harry's dad, so oh, like okay. he went, but he didn't get to be part of any of the ceremony. So like at he one just point, like in the, the back of the crowd, just watching. Yeah, he was just ch- like walking around in a suit. Like he didn't have any of the any, any of the crazy royal. Like, he wasn't robes like an usher on. or something. Nah, they yeah. didn't even let him do. A- hold the door, like sit people or anything. Um, Cause he's been completely like, he's out, you know yeah. what I'm saying? But like, I think he went just cause you know, it's his dad, his yeah. fucking dad. Yeah. But uh, they did have like whatever Harry's dickhead brother's name is it's, Prince Charles yeah. or something like that. Um, he, he was there obviously with his wife and there's this funny ass part where I, this is like the tradition that after the, the coronation, the, the King walks out or the queen walks out onto this balcony and there's like hundreds of thousands of Brits out there in the in the streets, like there he is. We laid eyes on him. We can see him, you know. And it's like, like less like the Pope, yes, kind of. yeah. yes. But it's it's less of that and more of like I was there, you know, for 2023. Like people were like, I'll get a fucking Instagram pick off with this shit, boy. Yeah. But he walked out, and he just looks again. He's just so old, and <laughs> and he just looks so unhappy, and. He's got his wife with him. She looked stoked because she's like, this is, you know, getting here. She's right there. She's like queen consort or whatever. I don't even know if she's actually that, but she's something. She's married to the king of England. And I was like, damn, where's like, where's, where's this, you know, where's his one kid who's still a part of this whole shenanigans? Well, (laughs) eventually they panned out and like down in the corner of the balcony, they had stuck the rest of the family. (laughs) So like Harry and his wife and his kids were all over in this corner. And this was after several minutes of this opening shot, which is the king and the queen on the balcony. And they had some of the little fucking kids up there to try to spark joy of some kind. Like, oh, look, the children, the youths. But then they finally pan out and the, he's just jammed the rest of the family into a corner so that they wouldn't take away from his spotlight on his big day as an elderly man being crowned king. It, it has to feel foolish. Like yeah, to, no, even, look, even for him, he probably thought he, like I look like an idiot right like, now this and is all the this stuff. Dumbest shit. <laughs> yeah. I like it's it. Yeah, a lot of people. I saw the meme. Uh, the washed media guys. I think Will DeFreeze put up uh, uh, a picture of the king with the crown on and the two scepters, and it said, uh, "I've got too much fucking shit on me." <laughs> and I, was, I was losing it, bro, because it was. There's never been a better time for the Carl Havoc meme than this man, this old man sitting there with a purple fucking robe cape on and two different scepters and a giant dumbass crown. 
and uh, it just made me chuckle. Did, did you see? Uh, I saw this on Twitter. There's like a Grim Reaper or something that like walked by. Like it's like in the very back, like oh in some my hallway. God. It, it, like it's super brief. Wait, I did see that. That was real though. I thought that was like CGI in it's, as a joke. I don't know if it was CGI because the quality was pretty shit. That is funny though, because um, he is very very old. Yeah. What is his name? King. King. King Charles, I think. Dude, when you <laughs> type in King Charles, the first thing that pops up is King Charles coronation, and the second thing that pops up is King Charles fingers. The third thing is King Charles hands, and the fourth thing is King Charles <laughs> tampon gate. What? <laughs> tampon gate. I don't know if I even want to know, but yeah, his name is his name is King Charles. So. Uh. There you go. Yeah. Got a new king. I don't know. Like, I don't really give a shit about the royal family, but there was a show on HBO Max, or I guess it'll be Max here in a little bit, that, like, it was, like, an animated show about the royal family, and they just, like, roast the absolute shit out no of it. No way. Yeah. It was pretty funny, but I don't think people liked it because they spoke ill of the, the royal family. Oh, uh, yeah. And the, people like, get real upset about like, that. They're super, like, character looking. Like, they yeah, just, yeah, like... Yeah. Um, emphasize like their their flaws and stuff it's pretty funny but this guy's life is a living hell though one of these articles i just typed in his name it says lip reader reveals king charles brutal remark to camilla that's his wife at his coronation and they they, like lip readers sat there and like translated everything he was saying to her in private so they've got like a paragraph here of him bitching about not being on time Quote, I'm worried about time. I mean, it's been longer this time. And well, um, I mean, look, I know. We, we can never be on time. Yes, I'm, this is a negative. There's always something. So he's just bitching and moaning about it not going quickly enough during the thing. Like, it sounds like he has as much to do, I feel like. I mean, you wouldn't think so. I guess, looks like he's 74 years old. God, he looks older than De Niro, was- though. <laughs> looks like he's in his 90s. Anyway, there's that guy. God, so his, is, the, uh, crown, the crown alone has to be worth like a few million bucks. It's just covered in diamonds and jewels. I just don't, I don't know how they got to fi- I know this is one of the big things with the royal family. Like how do they bring it to the modern day, the present day? You got to lose the get-ups, the fucking outfits. Yeah, you got to modernize you, it a little gotta bit. You got to do so- come out in some, you know, Balenciaga. Yeah, get... <laughs> Get a Gucci robe or something. Something else. This is, it's just too, it's too ridiculous. Are you aware we're in like a worldwide recession? It's just not a good look. Anyway, I watched some of that and it was a, it was a good laugh. It was worth a good Saturday morning laugh. Okay, that'll do it for today's show. But please support our sponsors by hitting the links in the description of this episode and using our dedicated codes, as that is how we pay the bills here at Bowling Media. You can find links to all our sponsors for today's episode in the description below. To check out our other shows, go to bowlingmedia.com. We've got Jared Borislow's F1 show, Formula Bone, J Bone. He's been covering F1 all season long and will continue to for the rest of the season with a race preview and recap for every single race that occurs. Jared does a phenomenal job. He's about to hit 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. He's got like 250,000 followers on TikTok. He's been killing it. We've got Oysters, Clams, and Cockles covering Succession's final season. We've got episode eight this Sunday. Only three episodes of Succession left ever. Oysters, Clams, and Cockles is a companion podcast where myself and Mr. Barrett Dudley, my co-host and friend of over 20 years, uh, digest and discuss what occurred in each episode with theories and questions and whatnot. Oysters, clams, and cockles available wherever you listen to RBP. And uh, go to bowlandmedia.com slash shop to grab yourself some RBP merch. I'm once again wearing the Ross Bowling Podcast Astro World inspired hat atop my head today, which you can get at bowlandmedia.com slash merch, or slash shop, excuse me. Also, the In Therapy hat that you see before me, on this typewriter here, if you're watching on youtube.com slash at the Ross Bolin podcast, where you can get full video of our show and funny smaller segments every single week, produced by none other than, none other than excuse me, producer Cade Oris, the man to my right. Cade, where can people follow you on social media? Uh, you can follow me at Cade Oris on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok as well. And that's 
K A D E O R R I S. Not a C. Not a C. It's a K. This episode of the Ross Bolin Podcast is presented by Bolin Media, and video of today's show was produced by Kate Oris. Go to youtube.com slash at the Ross Bolin Podcast and subscribe today. Even if you have no intention of watching the video, it just helps us out. We appreciate you. I'll be back later this week on patreon.com slash Ross Bolin Podcast with another ad-free exclusive episode. Until next time, peace be with you and also with you.